On the 31st of December 2020, one year after the coronavirus was first detected, the World Health Organization gave Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine emergency validation, making it the first to be given clearance by the organization, just seven months after first trials began, a record-breaking length of time. Other vaccines followed, AstraZeneca, Moderna, Sinopharm, Sputnik V, and Johnson & Johnson are now common names for a range of vaccines that are all being deployed in different parts of the world. Hundreds of millions of vaccine doses have been administered worldwide. There are over 7.5 billion people on Earth. With most vaccines requiring two doses, we still have a long way to go. You're listening to Beyond the Headlines, and I'm your host, Sohail Akram. And this week, we're looking at how to get the entire world vaccinated. Before we start, please subscribe to Beyond the Headlines to get the latest episodes on your favorite podcasting app. It was just a matter of weeks between the first reports of a mysterious and for some deadly pneumonia-like illness in China in December 2019. Within three months, the World Health Organization said the outbreak had become a pandemic. As days and months passed, the scale of the pandemic became clearer. It was something the modern world had never seen before. Ever since the pandemic began, the world has been battling one question. How to provide a vaccine to everyone in this unequal world? From the start, it was clear that we would need to find new ways of working to solve the pandemic. But classic problems still remained. Politics started to creep into the vaccine distribution, and companies struggled to get enough supplies to make the millions of vaccines on tight deadlines. As pharmaceutical companies scrambled to find a vaccine, the governments of the world started buying up doses before the drugs even existed. But there is evidence that the rich nations are buying up global supplies while poor nations wait. By April 2021, 49% of all vaccines had been administered in a small number of high-income countries, home to just 16% of the world's population. Based on current projections, many in poorer nations will be waiting until 2024 to achieve mass COVID-19 vaccination. But even one small factor can throw off the process of getting vaccines from manufacturer to patient. For example, in November 2020, Pfizer said that instead of delivering the promised 100 million vaccines, it would only deliver half that amount. The issue? Not sufficient supplies right at the beginning of the supply chain. Making a vaccine requires antivirus agents, antiseptic liquids, sterile water and equipment, filters, resin, tubing, and glass vials, among many other things. Once the vaccine is ready to go, there are many elements that must be in place to ensure a vaccine can be distributed across the world. Logistically, this is one of the biggest global endeavors known to humanity. Luckily, there has been some precedent set by previous vaccination campaigns. Dr. Ivan Houten is the Director of the Department of Universal Health Coverage for Communicable Diseases at the World Health Organization's regional office for the Eastern Mediterranean. In terms of the distribution of vaccines before coronavirus, we have different mechanism for countries to procure vaccine. We have vaccines that are upper middle income or higher income who tend to buy their own vaccine. And we have uh, countries that mostly on the low income or lower middle income who tend to procure a vaccine through systems that are facilitated by the United Nations, such as UNICEF. And usually, uh, big agencies like UNICEF uh, procure vaccine with large volume worldwide, which uh, makes sure that there is both the quality uh, with the WHO pre-qualification system and the quality, the, the quantity and the low prices. So this has been, if you want, our, base, uh, our basic system to procure vaccine. But even the World Health Organization has never had to deal with something of this scale before. The COVAX program that was set up in April 2020 to try to vaccinate the world's most vulnerable 20% is having to deal with many new factors. So for coronavirus, uh, there's been challenges around the issue of quality and is around the issue of quantity. First, in terms of quality, we have all kinds of new manufacturers who have come very rapidly to develop new vaccines. So the standard process that we use, the WHO pre-qualification system, cannot be used. We use 
an abbreviated version of this that doesn't cut corner, but just go faster. And it's called the WHO emergency use listing. So it's been quite a challenge to make sure that WHO was able to look at all the potential candidates for United Nations procurements and make sure that they were ongoing, undergoing an evaluation of quality as per the WHO emergency use listing. So that is a challenge in terms of quality. The second challenge, which has been uh, maybe the biggest one, has been around the quantity, because of course, uh, the pandemic has unfolded uh, quite fast, and these vaccines have been quite new, and the manufacturers have had to put together their manufacturing capacity very fast. So it means that at this stage, um, the volume that we need is not yet there. So that has been our number one struggle with the COVAX facility, uh, which is procuring vaccine for countries uh, with the participation of WHO, is to make sure that we can procure as much vaccine as we need right now. In November 2020, just before the first vaccines were approved, the United Arab Emirates formed the HOPE Consortium, a group of organizations working with the government to facilitate the global distribution of the coronavirus vaccine. The logistic challenges, like unlike anything else we've encountered, I've been in the business for, for 25 plus years. Uh, I've never come across anything of this scale and this complexity. Uh, and so what that means is that if we can't tackle this as a single party. Um, it doesn't matter the size of the brand, you just don't have the individual reach. Therefore, the way we tackle this is to make sure that we work together, we work collaboratively, and we leverage everybody's reach, the capacity and the strength, in order to provide this end-to-end -end solution. That was Robert Sutton, Head of Logistics for Abu Dhabi Ports and Lead for the HOPE Consortium. The HOPE Consortium was built with an intention to bring the UAE to the forefront of the fight against the pandemic and use the country's strategic location, being close to Europe and Asia, to make the vaccine distribution faster and efficient. With 3.6 billion people reachable within five hours of Abu Dhabi, it's ideally located to provide the service. One of the reasons this is vital is cold chains, a system in place to ensure the temperature of the vaccines is kept within safe range at all points from manufacture to needle. More on this in a little while. The project's cold chain distribution networks intend to serve those most in need of immunization. But how do you tackle one of the biggest supply chain issues in the world? We find the easiest way to look at these challenges to reverse engineer them. So we, we look at the end product. What do we want as an end solution from this? So clearly what we want as an end solution is to be able to vaccinate huge amounts of the population um, globally, whether you have a developed infrastructure or an emerging infrastructure. So once we look at the end game, then we work backwards from there. So then we understand the infrastructure capability, the flight times, the travel options, the transportation options, and we work that back to the demographics. So how many vaccines are required? How do we uh, move those vaccines to the country? Um, at what speed can we replenish? At what speed is the offtake? So all of these go into what we call a kind of um, a solution design model. Um, and what that provides us with, the end product of that, is we're able then to map from point of production all the way through to the patient each of the different challenges um, that we need to overcome in order to successfully deliver this model. Underneath that, then, we underpin that with a digital system, which allows us to track the vaccines through that journey. But even with reverse engineering, not all the requirements of the projects were predicted. Robert Sutton explains. We have to remember that the, the challenge is such that we haven't faced this before. It's bound to throw up some surprises. Um, and we've, we've seen a few surprises. One of the um, learnings from that is that moving vaccines is, is simply not enough. Um, when we deliver vaccines to a country, we then have an addi additional responsibility. So one of the um, learnings from this was that we needed to extend the value chain to help uh, transfer process and, and knowledge on the safe handling and storage of vaccines, but also the deployment of doctors, nurses, and healthcare administrators. So we, we actually moved those with the vaccines um, to support with on-the-ground vaccination programs. So one of the challenges was clearly uh, logistics in, it, in itself is not enough. 
we needed to provide some on-the-ground support and on-the-ground healthcare expertise um, to, to support the vaccination programs. I think that was one of the things we didn't anticipate um, in the early stages, but we're rapidly learning now that this is a key requirement, particularly in some of the developing markets. Aside from human expertise, one of the biggest challenges in ensuring the quality of the vaccine is that it remains safe, effective and untampered. One of the major considerations with vaccines is the temperature they are stored at. Traditionally, it's the World Health Organization that has dealt with the issue of storing vaccines in cold chains. Here is Dr. Ivan Hutin. Whenever we ensure the cold chain, and that is something that's absolutely not new, when we uh, ship a vaccine under the cold chain, we have systems, and that's really part and parcel of the cold chain, we have systems to document the cold chain throughout. So there's all kind of documentation of the way that the temperature is maintained throughout the journey so that there can be a full record of what has happened. And that is definitely something that does not change nor made more complicated during the uh, coronavirus uh, crisis. Uh, we've been able to use the same standard procedures to make sure that whenever the vaccine is being shipped, it's being shipped under cold chain and with the same level of documentation of the temperature throughout the journey. For the HOPE Consortium, they have brought a wealth of technological resources to make the vaccine distribution efficient. One of those is its cooling technology. The consortium's containers maintain steady temperature for an average of 202 hours. That's about eight and a half days, and self-recharge automatically. It can handle around 11.4 million doses at ultra-cold temperatures of minus 80 degrees Celsius that are being developed and manufactured around the world in cold and ultra-cold storages, making it the largest capacity and logistics capability regionally and one of the largest globally. Here is Robert Sutton again. There are actually three levels of clear um, technology uh, which help us maintain the supply chain integrity. And the supply chain integrity, the digital aspect of that was a key element. So we, we're very fortunate that we have Macta Gateway, which is digital arm of Abu Dhabi Ports, as one of the founders of the whole consortium. And they've developed a product production to patient um, track and trace system which allows us to monitor and track vaccines all the way from point of production right the way through the supply chain and to the patient application or patient administration. So that was one of the kind of technology, how we use technology there to, to monitor not only the supply chain, but the consumption and offtake of, of the vaccine in the destination country. We back that technology then into the logistics control tower in Kizad. Um, so our team in Kizad, which monitor this screen 24 seven, we're able to see vaccines all around the world that have moved through our supply chain and are either in the warehouse in transit or at a hospital or clinic waiting to be, to be administered to the patient. So there, there's two examples of how we use technology. The last one is obviously vaccines are extremely temperature sensitive, uh, particularly when we look at the more complex brand, which is minus 80. We've invested in a freezer farm um, in our facility in Kizad. Um, it can carry over 11 million doses. And that freezer farm is digitally linked to our control tower. So whether we're in a shopping mall or whether we're in the office or the warehouse, we can, through our applications, through our mobile apps, we can monitor um, these, this equipment and identify any variations from the protocols which have been set. So that's how we've used technology. Um, Immunity is a very unique system which delivers that completely unique uh, digital layer of visibility. The way they ensure the vaccine has been stored safely and effectively throughout its journey is by using blockchain technology. We use blockchain. Blockchain supports the immunity um, and the whole supply chain, how it's developed here. And if you look at Abu Dhabi uh, ports and the Macta Gateway um, entity within Abu Dhabi ports, they've been using blockchain for a number of years now, and we have a number of successful programs running with blockchain. What this allows us to do, it allows us to transfer data seamlessly um, with our partners globally, and we're able to then make sure there's a digital fingerprint right away through the supply chain. 
um, through, through the use of this technology. And again, we couldn't do this in isolation. We do this with our partners um, who also invest heavily in, in IT and technology to enable these blockchain transactions uh, to seamlessly move between the parties. Ignatius Schultz is a senior operations manager for Abu Dhabi Ports Logistics. He has recently returned from a trip to Africa to deliver vaccines with the Hope Consortium. Well, the people that I met, um, they are, you know, they are and they were so excited about it. Um, you, you can see there's a real need for vaccination there and for a change for them as well. And, and you can actually see it in, in their body language. You can hear it in their voices. You can see it in their faces that they were just too, too happy for vaccines finally arriving. And you can see that for them, it's like, you know, they've waited for so long. Um, and to actually finally have it for them to take it, it was quite interesting. I mean, at the times when the, the jabs or the inoculations were done, the amount of um, selfies that they took, and I've had a lot of individuals ask me, please record this while, you know, while I'm getting my jab. For them, it's a proud moment. It's a very, very proud moment. So it was great to see the eagerness from them to actually receive it. Although there have been many concerns around the world about vaccine hesitancy, Ignatius says he didn't encounter any of it. In terms of hesitation, I did not come across that um, because the people that I saw and the citizens I saw, they were more keen just to get it done um, and, and so happy once it was done. You know, it's like that little fist in the air, like excited that finally got the first, first dose. Um, but yeah, you will always get hesitant. It doesn't matter where in the world, you'll always get individuals and that's what makes individuals so great. Not everybody thinks the same, but the people that I came across and the citizens that I came across, I came across more positivity in finally having vaccines in their destinations as opposed to being hesitant or negative about it. Ignatius was eager to be involved from the minute he got the opportunity. I was approached and asked, do I want to be a part of it? And reach out and um, you know, globally get uh, the vaccines across, put my hands up immediately without thinking twice. Um, because ideally, the same as everybody else, you want to get life back to normal. Um, today, we are in the new norm of wearing masks and being more careful and cautious. However, everybody, including myself, do want to go back to what the way life used to be. Although many in wealthier countries are seeing high levels of vaccination, there are